I'm really happy to introduce Paul Weisecker. Uh, he's a clinical psychologist who's been in practice for more than 30 years, providing direct service to adults diagnosed with psychotic disorders. And for about the same period of time, he's been involved in research about psychosocial approaches to promoting recovery. And over several decades, he's been the author of a number of publications and the recipient of federal research funding. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you so much. And thank you to Ron, you and the organizing committee for inviting me. And thank you to the participants who have signed in today. I've recognized several good friends amongst the list, but obviously a number of people who maybe haven't heard about this work before. And I look forward to sharing this material with you. If there's a, maybe a first point on the slide, it's my email. Uh, I'm happy to respond to any and all uh, people who have would like to talk more offline about this, or if you're interested in learning more about how to get training in these techniques or to share some of your concerns or questions, please feel free. It's plysiker at iupui.edu. And please, again, feel free to write to me freely and liberally. Uh, I thought I would begin by sort of, I'm going to be talking about an approach to psychotherapy for adults who've been diagnosed with psychosis. Uh, and I thought I might begin by giving you a little bit of a historical background about how I became interested in this and have how I've become as involved as I have in trying to understand and think about these issues. And for me, in large part, my interest dates back to a time called the 1980s. And I was a student in, at Kent State in Ohio and had a job at a small mental health center in a, a town called Canton, Ohio, which is famous in the United States because it's the American Football Hall of Fame is located there, but otherwise a quiet uh, town in Ohio. And so I, had, I, had, I got a job. I was a therapist in the mental health center, and I was sort of the new guy on the block, as we say. Uh, and the first thing that happens for the new guy is they get to work with many of the people who are coming there who no one knows how to help, or people who no one is sure what would be useful. And these were largely adults who had been diagnosed with profound and disabling psychotic disorders. And I quickly discovered that I had little sense of what to do outside of being supportive and being a human being and interacting with this group of people. And so it started for me. So this is the 1980s. I began to meet with a group of adults diagnosed with psychotic disorders, many of whom are, again, have profound levels of disability, profound levels of disorganization, emptiness, stigma, withdrawal, etc. And I was struck at the more I met at some of the remarkable changes that happened as a result, or at least concurrent with our meetings. It, I often felt as if many of the people I worked with, I, I had a little sense of who they were, their life, their being, their personhood seemed like lost in a fog. And it seemed like the more I met, the more people emerged from that fog, the more I got to know them, the more they seemed to take charge of their lives in ways that seemed really significant to me. And I was struck at that point in time that I had no idea what had happened that was making this go on. I think there were plenty of uh, ideas about generic support and maybe some ideas about sort of the self, but what was really happening? And in fact, what was actually even changing that these remarkable things were, 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 were observed by me? So the work I'm going to talk to you today is really growing out of an effort to understand what can happen in psychotherapy that really promotes recovery for people, regardless of the acuity with which they are afflicted by something that could be called psychosis. I want to do that in order to make it available as something we can think about and study, but also something that can be described and used by, by people broadly. So let's see if I can... Here we go. This is a copy of the a picture of the manual. It's available on Amazon. It describes in a little more detail what's involved. I want to mention that this work, while well, I've just given you a, a snapshot of me as a much younger person struggling with these issues in Canton, Ohio, this is the work that's been taken on by a number of close friends and colleagues all over the world, including several who have signed in today. 
And this is really part of an ongoing larger network of people trying to think about what is happening in recovery and what could happen in psychiatry. And this is actually a, a small list of the people. The list could get larger and had, continues to grow. So what I'm going to be talking to you today about is a kind of therapy. We refer to it as MERIT. That stands for Metacognitive Reflection and Insight Therapy. And just to give you a, a hint of what's to come, the goal of this is to enable persons diagnosed with a serious mental illness to make sense of emergent challenges and possibilities in their lives, to decide how to manage and live with those challenges and possibilities, and ultimately to promote meaning-making agency and a sense of community membership. If I think more than anything, this is what I think what I hope to share with you today is less of, uh, about what you should do and more you should, should be more about how you think about what you do. I think merit offers a way to think about what's happening in your sessions, to track what's happening in a clinical session, and to decide how to respond to how things are going. Now, certainly, the ideas here may lead you to emphasize certain aspects of your practice and de-emphasize others. But I think this is also about making visible the processes that support recovery and that may be key to what goes on in a successful therapy session. Ultimately, I, the ambition is that this is laying bare some of the things that were happening in these sessions in Canton, and that I think happened in sessions all over the world and have happened in with skilled psychotherapists and recovering persons for, for decades and decades. I want to start with a couple caveats. Uh, diagnostic labels are controversial. Many people res resist the term schizophrenia. In Europe, people have turned to psychosis. Other groups have developed newer terms. I tend to be more comfortable with the term schizophrenia and psychosis as it reflects alterations in how a person experiences themselves and others. This is really not a therapy that's about symptoms though. It's also not a therapy necessarily about skills. And it's also not a therapy that is about sort of larger slogans. It's much more about the experience of a person and their interpretations of that experience, about how people make sense of a life full of challenges and possibilities that follow or precede the diagnosis of psychosis and how they live with it. So here is uh, sort of, if we're not gonna talk about symptoms or skills, what are we gonna talk about? Over time, we're gonna talk about disability as a lack of a sense of agency, but a person who doesn't feel as if they're an agent in the world who can live with and make sense of things. It's about a lack of a sense of purpose and, and also possibility ahead of oneself. I think if you look at any number of, of, of competently executed qualitative studies, we discover that persons diagnosed with psychosis or persons with lived experience of psychosis report that they often don't feel like an agent in, in the world, that their major concerns are not having a sense of purpose or possibility. There may also be incomprehensible a lack of comprehensible challenges Things may seem overwhelming or, or nonsensical, and, and perhaps most of all, a, a profound and pervasive sense of isolation. But this is what's really going to be an issue as we move forward in talking about merit today. And the goal of merit is self-management, that people make sense of their challenges and decide to live with them in ways that make sense for them and their communities. And that self-management is always about the development of agency, purpose, possibility, comprehensible challenges, and ultimately community membership. I do want to say this is in some ways, I want to acknowledge throughout this, this is, a lot of this is not, is not profoundly new. In fact, it is an attempt to describe in a somewhat more systematic way, much older ideas. And in fact, if we think about, if I think about Boyle, who termed or coined the term schizophrenia, what he really wrote about was that thought becomes fragmented, that there is a disintegration or a lack of integration among thoughts. This is what he refers to as disturbances in association. Same with fragmentation or lack of integration among emotion, he refers to that as disturbances in affect, and fragmented desire or wishes and hopes that are, are, are not fully integrated. And as a result, the experience of the self in the world 
loses comprehend comprehendability, it becomes incomprehensible, and there develops a kind of impenetrable aloneness, which Bloiler called autism during his time. So I think, you know, here we have something that is quite similar to what Bloiler originally tells us, but it also matches emerging and very important qualitative work that takes into account the voices of persons. So what, what are the barriers though to thinking about this? What are the barriers to taking this model here and moving forward with it? Well, it's, I, I think we need to understand what are the disturbances in agency purpose? What are the things that underlie those disturbances? What is the source of them? And, and most importantly, and what's gonna be essential for the rest of this talk is how to measure these. You can sort of have a sense of what it means to have a set of fragmented thoughts, emotions, and desires, but how could you quantify that in a way that was respectful to the person experiencing it, but that also is scientifically sound? So the talk is going to be from here on out divided into three sections. The first will we're going to I'm going to use the term metacognition to describe the processes that lead to fragmented uh, thoughts, emotions, wishes, and aloneness. And then talk about supporting research. And ultimately, we're going to come to talking about our treatment, which is merit. I'm going to pause at the end of each section. And if there are questions that you really would like to get an answer to before we move further, I'll, I'll, I'll offer you a chance to do that. We will end with 30 minutes for Q&A also at the end of this, though. So I want to make sure that you have a chance. So if there's something that seems just unclear, and it would help to get some clarification to that earlier on. All right, so I'm going to use metacognition as a term to describe what's going on underneath all of this stuff. And this is a term that was originally used in educational research. It was meant to describe how learners make sense of their own learning. It was later used in psychopathology research to describe how people form ideas about themselves, how they relate to their own thinking, their own reactions in their bodies, how people monitor and think about what's going on. And it, across all of this research, it always involves thinking about thinking or forming a sense of what's happening with oneself and also monitoring and changing behavior. It's how we sort of know what's going on. It's the process by which we know and which we think about ourselves, wonder what we're up to and wonder what we should be doing. I think it has really important properties I want to just go over in general. It is always ongoing and responsive. In other words, metacognition is not just what you do late at night when you wonder about your life. But if you go to a restaurant and someone is rude to you, you wonder, what sort of person do I want to be? How do I want to respond to this? And it can be effortful, but it can also be automatic. Our ideas of ourselves can just appear to us. And then we think about it and we can be surprised by them. And ultimately, it isn't just a, a hypercognitive activity, but it involves us pulling together or synthesizing the things that are going on in our body our emotions, as well as our thoughts. And just to give you an illustration, you can imagine that you're at a meeting somewhere and your foot is tapping, your face is warm, and you're thinking, should I break my diet tonight and eat pizza? So this is actually me in a meeting wondering about this. And how, how could those fit together? Metacognitive processes might make me conclude that the foot tapping, the warmth, my thoughts wandering, has to do with something in the meeting that I'm angry about. So it isn't just a tapping foot or wondering about pizza. I'm angry, something is upsetting me. And then I could think, but it's not really the meeting, but there's been something in my life that's very sad that's just happened, and I'm struggling with that. Alternatively, I could also decide that I'm overreacting to something like I always do. But regardless, this enables me to pull together a sense of what's happening and to respond to it. Importantly, this is always intersubjective. None of us form ideas about ourselves in isolation. And if you need proof of this, and I, I will tell you, my only disclosure here is I use the same joke. So if you've heard this before, you'll, you, can, you can tell me later if the jokes get worse or bad. But if you want proof that, it, that metacognition is intersubjective, no one decides on their own if they're free. You don't get to decide on your own if you're empathic or non-narcissistic. Our senses of ourselves are always formed with other people. And in fact, when we see people who are not doing that, who think they're funny when no one else does, it'd be big trouble. And of course, this is all multi-determined. There's lots of things that come together that enable us to form a sense of who we are. 
And as a result, I have a sense of who I am that's immediately available. I have a sense of who I am as a human being. It is evolving and holistic, and it is characterized by purposes, possibilities, and also it tells me a place that I have in the world. So my sense of who I am is not just my age or gender or ethnic background or interests, tastes. It's a sense of what am I doing in the world as a human being? What are others doing too? And what are our places? And this is the same about other people as well. The sense of myself and others becomes available because of that. 